if you're a new manager and someone gets moved from somebody else's team to your team, there is a lot that comes with that. There is the, why am I being moved? Why do I have the new manager? I don't maybe want this manager. You know, it can feel like a demotion sometimes. And so pretty quickly, I was also navigating that. Like, how do I work with somebody who got really used to and enjoyed the way they worked with their previous manager and against their will, they now have to work with me. Hello, and welcome to Growing Through It, your go-to podcast for real leadership stories. I'm your host, Jen Arnold. In every episode, you'll hear straight talk from leaders who face their own challenges. We'll dive into those whoops moments and the insights that followed. This podcast is about the lessons that refine us, shared to help you confidently lead in your own style. Whether you're looking to steer your team towards success or just seeking a spark of inspiration, you're in the right place. Let's grow through it together. Lex, welcome to the Growing Through It podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. Me too. Thank you for having me. Well, let's kick it kick it off. As I've said to you before we started recording, I have done a very poor job of introducing my guests. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, just give us a rundown of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. My name is Lex Mashakis, and I am the co-founder of an organization called Live Big. And what we do is work with adolescents on building confidence, resilience, and self-leadership skills. But it was quite a journey to get here. Um, Actually, my professional story starts in law school. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, spent five minutes in a law firm. I'm sorry to any lawyers listening. And I was like, nope, this isn't for me. So I did what anyone does when they realize they've made a career whoopsie daisy, we'll call it. I packed up a move to New York and found my way actually in sales. And shortly after spending some time in fintech sales, I was introduced to a legal services firm, which felt like, you know, finally my law degree can actually be put to use and I would be working the business development side. So because of that legal degree that I had, I was able to move into that legal services firm at a higher level than I probably would have otherwise, which put me into a people leadership role. Um, So there I am, you know, mid-20s, recruiting people basically straight out of college and people leadership, and I'm still very new in my own career. Um, Hey, Lex, I'm I'm going to stop you right there because I think one thing to point out is that you moved from from Australia, right? From yes. Adelaide, yeah. like you're like, yeah, I just moved. I picked up and moved. So you decided <laughs> law wasn't for you, and not only was law for you and not for you, maybe Australia wasn't for you. <laughs> Did you? Not at the time. <laughs> no, I mean, I'd spend some time in New York, and I was like, this is where you go to start your life over. Like New York, if you've been, it's not for everybody, I know, but to me, it was just the coolest mm-hmm. city. Um, so it felt right for me. Yeah, I love that city. It's a wonderful city. Yeah. So then you went to ultimately, you were sorry to interrupt, but you just kind of glossed over. You're like, no, you know, but just picked up and moved. Big deal. <laughs> um, so you started as a, as a leader um, and you're about 20, mid 20s. Mm-hmm. And uh, when they gave you that role, did you hire into that role or were you at the organization and they like you got promoted into the role? So in the recruiting process, they had told me that I would, I I was a player coach. So I was doing the role and I was managing the role, the hybrid leadership role to start. And they told me I would just play the role and learn it for three to six months or so before I would get my own team. But within my first week of being there, my manager goes, hey, we want you to just take the three people that are starting in a few weeks. And so I thought I had some time to learn what I would be doing and to build my confidence. And he was like, nope, I think you can do it. You're going to have your team. Okay. The- so it uh, <laughs> seemed like you had a very nice, safe way to to get into <laughs> leadership. And then that was the, forget it, moving fast. Thought I had ready. a ramp, no ramp. What um, did you do? Did you just dive in or anything that you did to prepare yourself? Well, 
okay, so I had about two weeks before they started. So it was like a, right, let me learn everything that I can about this company and this job that I am going to be onboarding myself into while being responsible for onboarding others. And the sheer panic that that caused in me, um, I am very much a perfectionist in the way that a lot of people are. I really struggle when I don't know what I'm doing. I'm working through that Um, and feeling like I need to have all the answers all the time. And so I was literally unable to have the answers for my new team because I was still figuring it out for myself. Um, And that was at that time a massive challenge because I thought what it meant to be a leader is I had to have all the answers and I had to be perfect at the job and I had to be the best, quote unquote, at it because otherwise why would people want to be in my team and why would people feel safe being you know, under my leadership. And so that was one of the most challenging professional experiences I've had. Like the day that the three of them walked into the office and I was tasked with giving them the tour that I'd only had a few weeks ago, you know, it was. Like looking at notes. (laughs) This is where the cafeteria. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So three people. Is that how you started or because you had a larger team after that, correct? Yes. So I started with three in that player coach role. And this was a team where things were always moving. The business development organization, just for some context, it's normally an entry level organization straight out of college. It's normally a bigger team, business development. They're the team that's cold calling. They are sending emails. There's a big team that does that. Um, and so I started with three and there was another manager who worked there also, but we, after, gosh, I don't know, three to six months, maybe we shook things up and then I took on a few more. So then I had a team of five while I was still doing the role. Um, and then as the years sort of went on, eventually I had eight and then I had 12 and I stopped doing the role, um, So the number of people that I had was constantly in flux. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions as you're hearing this coming up. But one of the things that I'll call out is if you're a new manager and someone gets moved from somebody else's team to your team, there is a lot that comes with that. There is the why am I being moved? Why do I have the new manager? I don't maybe want this manager you know, it can feel like a demotion sometimes. And so pretty quickly I was also navigating that. Like how do I work with somebody who got really used to and enjoyed the way they worked with their previous manager and against their will, they now have to work with me. Um, That's such a great point. I've had the same thing happen to me. Like the whole team was broken up and had to come report to me and they didn't want to. Like I don't blame them. They were a tight team, right? Um, was there anything in particular that you did around that? Like, could you win them over? Because some you can't always win them over and you could kill yourself trying and it's just not going to happen. What was your um, approach? Honestly, I wish I could tell you I had one. And that was one of the biggest learnings. I didn't realize at the time how challenging that is for somebody. Because often when we take a job, we take the job because of the person who's going to be managing you. And that wasn't me when they chose to take that job. And so in one instance, you know, it was a pretty smooth transition. It went great. But in another, I know there was some frustration for that person. They had been in that job before I got to the company. And so then suddenly here I am. I learned the job from them. Basically, they were a mentor to me. And then they're expected to report into me. And I I know it makes sense based on what was going on in the business at the time and the reasons they were moved on paper, that was sound. But now that I can sit in the position of that person and to think about what it was like for them, um, that would have been really difficult. And when I reflect on it, I wish what I had done is called that out and been like, hey, this wasn't your choice. You didn't join this company to work with me. You joined this company to work with them. You taught me this job. So let's figure out how to make it work for you, given that this is the position we're in. I didn't do that. And I wish that I did. And it's one of the things that I learned pretty quickly. It's 
there is never a need for a front. You know, like things happen in an organization that as a middle manager, it's outside of your control. And if you just call that out, everyone respects it. But by expecting that they would like it, that's that was one of the first big mistakes that I made. No, if it makes you feel any better, I did the same. In hindsight, it's always twenty twenty, right? Like you look back and you're like, oh yeah, I really could have handled that better. Same. Yeah. Like just you respect people who just call out the elephant in the room, right? Like, yeah, I understand, right? And, and what you just said, how can I make this work for you? So yeah. did that person end up staying or did they end up kind of transitioning? Sounds like it was all in flux anyway. They ended up leaving. The thing with this role is it's very cyclical in nature, mm -hmm. which in some ways as a leader, it's great. You know, before I was 30, I'd probably managed a few dozen people because it's not a role you're meant to stay in for very long, 12 to 18 months. In an ideal world, you career path into another role within the organization, but often you move somewhere else. And this person moved somewhere else. Um, and, you know, we, we left it on good terms and all of that. It wasn't like some horrible situation, but I think about that person often and what I would have done differently, mm -hmm. um, knowing what I know now. So, yeah, it was it was tough for them for yeah. sure. Let me lesson learned. Yeah. Well, what what else did you? I can't imagine there's a, there's lots of lessons or challenges that you experienced as yeah. you were trying to get up and running yourself. Yeah, the hiring and firing piece mm -hmm. was really hard, um, and you can't sugarcoat it. Like in a business, if you hire somebody to do a role, they're not able to perform in that role. They have to either be let go from that team or you have to help them find somewhere else in the organization. And I remember the first time I had to let somebody go. It was, gosh, maybe six months into being a manager. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, keep in mind, I'm not that much older than these people. I, I don't really know how these things go. I've not been in the corporate setting. Thankfully, I had a really great HR partner. Make friends with your HR team is also a big lesson in that. Yes. He literally sat there and gave me a script and was like, this is what you need to say. Um, but I just remember feeling like I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe. I was visibly shaking, just so nervous about what it was that I had to do. And I didn't actually hire this person um, and they weren't the last person that I had to let go of. But what those experiences taught me was the most important thing you can do as a manager is learn how to recruit effectively mm -hmm. and be really clear on what you are recruiting for. And what I've come to believe is that if you hire somebody and they are trying and they have been honest in the recruiting process and they're not meeting your standards, you failed. Mm -hmm. That's on you. It's not on the recruiter. It is not on them. It's actually on you because you didn't evaluate their skills in the way that you needed to, to know that they would be successful. And I call that out because I made that mistake a few times. And in, in some ways you have to make it to realize what exactly you're testing for mm -hmm. um, and what you're wanting people to be able to take on. But I, I saw this in colleagues who were in leadership I see this in other companies they don't value recruiting they give it out to a recruiting function or they ask someone else on the team to do it they aren't clear on what the role entails they aren't clear on the skill set that they're looking for and then that person comes in they're not set up to be successful mm -hmm. it's yeah. hopefully they are but they're probably not going to be and then as a manager, you're left having to let go of that person and rehire them again. And hopefully you care about that person and you try and help them find another way out. But a lot of managers don't. So that was the biggest thing for me. I, I made a lot of mishires. Mm -hmm. And the more I realized that it was my responsibility, the better my hiring became, but also I was able to part ways with those people from a much better place because we could be really honest around, you know, this isn't working. Here is why this is on me. How can I help you figure out the right next step for you? Yeah. I love that you said that. And I think you're right. I think it, they, people, managers just want someone else to find the candidate. I've also seen job descriptions that are way too big for one person. Like it's not one skill, it's maybe 10 different skills and 
one person can't have all this, you know, it's not realistic to have someone I'm in the details and I'm very good at strategy, like these polar yeah. opposite skills. And so I, I saw one of the job description. I was like, Hey, if you want this person to be successful, you may want to dial it back to about three core responsibilities and yeah. look for that person. And it, you have to figure out what you want, who you want. Um, a mistake I've made hiring is hiring people too much like me. Yes. Like I, I, it, we do it. We're all biased. And I think if we say, if we say, Oh, we're not biased. Yes, you are. You're human. I've, I've hired people that I was like, Oh, I, they just reminded me of me. And I was like, okay, I know I can trust them to get the job I done. Them. I don't know why. I <laughs> <laughs> about them. I really yeah. enjoy. <laughs> They're like me five years ago. Like, right. Guilty also. <laughs> yeah. So I like that you say just taking that um, ownership of it. I also want to go back to what you said about letting someone go. I've had to let people go. It's it's not fun. And, and so when you were letting that person go and you're visibly shaking, like how did you – Is it, it? do you even remember that or did you just black out during the, the, the letting that person go because you were so nervous? Like how did you get through it? Uh, I don't remember what I said. I was just an autopilot, but I remember like, you know, the feeling you're so nervous, your mouth full, feels like it's filled with like cotton wool and you just like, you can't just, I would have drunk three liters of water probably in that <laughs> 10 minute conversation if it was right there. Um, I'll never forget the physical reaction and just being shocked by the physical reaction, which is, you know, my nervous system on alert because of danger and it's mm -hmm. sensing danger because I am a people pleaser also working on it, but clearly not pleasing that person in that moment, clearly putting them through a lot of pain. And so my body reacted to that, like, this is not safe. This is, we don't like this. Um, I will say it's, it, it got easier every time, but I think the reason it got easier was because I learned how important it is to be so, so transparent in the lead up to that conversation so that they know it's coming and it's not a surprise. Oh, and yes. one of the things I'm probably proudest of is there were a few times where I partnered with the person who was not performing. I was super clear on it, but I was also able to hold space for them to talk to me about what they felt, which was, I don't like this either. Mm -hmm. You know, no one enjoys not doing well at their job, nobody. And once I was able to open up that conversation, it was like, okay, well, here's what we can do. We can put you on a pip. Here is what that pip will be like. It will not be easy, but I believe in you. I'm here to support you. Or like you can start to think about other roles and I will give you a referral. Or I also would help people move into another part of the organization if I could. And people were like, are you sure you want to do that? That's a risk. They're underperformers. And it's like, well, they're not underperforming people. Mm -hmm. they're just not a fit for this role doesn't mean they can't do something else phenomenally well and so it got to a place where I was able to have those conversations and I was able to actually help them in their career figure out what would work for them and what wouldn't rather than just giving them an experience of I failed and I got fired so yeah I love that you're proud of yeah you should be I mean that's it's a talent, right? To give people the, the, the feedback. I say clear as kind, like shouldn't be a surprise. You know, this, I believe in you, you can get off this pip, but there is another option. Maybe there's another role better suited for you. So that way they have a choice. It gives them that autonomy. So I think yeah. it's brilliant of you to say, all right, well, here's your choice. Cause it is, it's not just get on this pip or you're going to be fired. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, they want to stay. They probably don't. <laughs> right. Why, you know, why would you, if, if you're not feeling like you're thriving in your job, no one wants to feel that way. We spend way too much time working to do something that doesn't make us feel very good. Yeah. And you mentioned hiring. So you said that you refined your process through hiring, you know, at, over time. And it would take us through like, how did it start? Like, what was your maybe criteria for hiring early days? And then how did you learn from that and get to be better at selecting uh, the right candidate? Yeah. So I was lucky in that my manager is an extraordinary manager. He's still a mentor today. He believed in the importance of recruiting. And so he had done a lot of work to figure out what the steps would look like. Um, 
so the steps were in place. They didn't change that much. You know, it was a recruiting screen. It was a call with a manager. It was a call with other people. It was a case study. And then it was interviews by other people in the office that they would interact with. Um, maybe some tweaks I'd make in hindsight, but like for the most part, that was solid. But it was how I was showing up in that process and what I was looking for within that framework that changed. I had thought that to recruit people, you need to be very like strict and like, here are my questions and I'm going to ask them in a very structured way. And that works for some people. But what I realized is if I could actually put them at ease, I could get to know them a lot better as people. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to see the polished version with the pre-prepared questions that everyone prepares for because most interviewers honestly ask them. You need to ask them questions they weren't expecting, but you need to make it safe for them to answer it in a way that's like true to them. So I learned to very deliberately disarm them, not to trick them, but just to be like, look, if you take this job, we're going to be working really closely together. I'm sure you've prepared answers. I've read your resume. You've made it this far. So let's just put all that aside and let's have like an honest and hopefully fun, different conversation. So that was always a really great window into who these people were when they weren't recruiting. Lex, I love that. Just because God, how many times have people like you interview someone and they interview so good and then it's just not a good job, right? <laughs> because anyone can, you know, practice and give those standard answers. Yeah. And I am going to put you on the spot. So if you don't know the answer, that's okay too. Um, <laughs> are there any questions that you would ask people to get to know them? That yeah. would help you have insight. Um, I would ask them to teach me something I don't know in two minutes. And it would, you know, I, I, I got taught about musicians. I got taught about how to send invisible text messages. Um, I got taught about lots of random different things. And obviously it was never the thing. I just wanted to see how they'd go about doing that and what mattered to them and what came up instantly. I would ask them questions that were a little bit different. Like if you were a cuisine, what would it be and why? And so I remember speaking with a New Yorker. I think it was her. She was like, oh, I'm pizza. And I was like, why are you pizza? And they're like, well, because you're going to have so many different toppings, but it's always like, you know, you're going to enjoy it. And, and they would like rationalize in a really smart, intelligent, but very personable way, how they got to the answers they'd get to. And that was a better window into them than like what's something you're working through right now, you know, all the mm-hmm. generic recruiting questions that you can get. Oh, my God. I, I'm sitting here going, what would I be? What would I be? That would be harder, harder no. for me. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and I think I think you have to be like, I'm going to ask you some questions you've never thought about. You're not going to know the answer. That's okay. Like, don't worry. Such um, a good point. Yeah, it, 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 you know. Figure out how people feel when things are ambiguous, right? Or you don't know the answers. Right. I love it. I, I really love that question about teaching me something I don't know in two minutes because you could get any, I was sitting there, what would I tell her? Yeah, that's, that's what goes through my mind. But I would love even a, a manager to use that with their team because think yeah. about how much you could learn about your team because it doesn't have to be a work thing. No, it, it could be anything. I think a lot of personal things would crop up there. I think I might have even asked that it not be a work thing. Oh, Um, even better. Yeah. Like I think as a manager, yes, you've got to teach the skills of the job, but also if you're doing it well, you are their career coach. You are helping them figure out challenges in their life. You are helping them learn skills around communication, time management. You're not just there to teach them the ropes of a job. Right. You were there to support the whole person because we spend a lot of time at work. And so you need to know who that person is beyond what you're going to be asking them to do. Well, thanks for those questions. I hope people can take them and start using them. <laughs> Throw their interview questions out. HR may not oh, like that. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But there, there is a time and a place for that. You could still ask them, but they've probably already answered it in your process at some point. So mm-hmm. yeah. I ask Something you mentioned when we were talking before recording was that you hired a, initially on kind of resume or, or pedigree, maybe, or degree. Yeah. And, and can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think in 
the corporate world, and I think especially in the States, there is an assumption that if they come from a quote unquote good school, they are quote unquote smarter and will be better at the job. And I just fundamentally believe that to not be true. Um, And I believe that for a few reasons. The first is those good schools are not necessarily a reflection of intelligence. It's also a reflection of means. You know, not everyone can afford to go to those schools. Not everyone is set up through their high school experience to dedicate themselves to grades in the way that other people are. Um, You know, I think about if you're a child who's raised in a single parent home, you're probably looking after younger siblings and not spending as much time on homework. And so you probably aren't getting the same grades as someone who has a lot of support in that way. And so you are making do with wherever you go to school. And that's great. Like we should be looking for people who have demonstrated um, responsibility Mm -hmm. because I don't think grades alone are a reflector of responsibility you know the the educational experience from childhood through to when you graduate university you take a subject you study for it you hopefully pass your tests your exams um and don't get me wrong that takes work that's not an easy thing to do by any means but you can you can learn if that works for you And when you go to college and you have the best professors who are there to set you up for success, you aren't necessarily demonstrating being able to take a project and run with it on your own, to work in ambiguity. The academic setting isn't often very ambiguous. Um, You're not demonstrating necessarily cross-communication skills with different stakeholders. So... I learned very quickly that, like, yes, there are brilliant people coming out of great schools, but also someone could be coming from a, a lower tier school, but maybe they paid their way through college. Mm-hmm. If you've managed to pay your way through college and you've come out with little debt and you worked a part time job and you managed your grades, I'll take that lower GPA with that ability to work through it over a higher GPA at a higher quality, quote unquote, school. Um, so just realizing that it doesn't tell the whole story. And if we are to truly recruit people in a way that is equitable and fair and actually maximizes the potential of a team, we can't just be recruiting from Ivy League schools. No. And I think the same thing goes to people with advanced degrees. So I think there, you know, you can go back to school. So it's still in the education track, but, you know, there's a, a recent um, hire with a PhD, but <laughs> that's great. They can be a PhD, but they're sitting in their office and they're not interacting yeah. with anyone. Right. Like, so it, it is a lot about, I, you know, the, the willingness to work hard, the yeah. willingness to try to, like you said, to collaborate across. And that doesn't always come with the education. So uh, yeah. I just wanted to point that because I think that's, I think that's important because we're all, that's another bias. Seeing yeah. a resume, they've got a great a degree. They come from a prestigious university or they have a PhD or they have a million degrees. It can maybe set you apart, but maybe can also cloud your judgment a little bit. Yeah, and it 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 did to me. I remember um, recruiting from, I think it was Columbia, and he was the head of the football team, and he had a great GPA, and we connected really well personally. He'd actually had lived in Australia, so you know there were like some reasons why we connected. But I remember in his case study feeling concerned, and. Those concerns, I think if there were other people, honestly, I probably wouldn't have moved forward with him. But I was like, you know what? He's a football player. I'm sure he's not afraid to pick up the phone and make cold calls. And he had a great GPA. I'm sure he's going to work hard and he's really smart and all of those things. And he was really smart and he did work really hard, but he was just so not a fit. Mm -hmm. And we both talked about it and we both realized it and Um, I look back on his recruiting process, I knew he wasn't a fit, but I overlooked it because of those assumptions that I had made. And so it's, 
it's so, so important that you, you figure out what your hiring criteria are, you figure out your process and you stick to it and you not let your biases creep in because that's exactly what bias will do to you. It'll cloud your judgment. Absolutely. Now you, you talked about, you know, just want to recap a little bit because I think it's important. You talked about it being transparent, addressing the elephant in the room, which you've learned to do. Um, make sure it's not a surprise, obviously, as you are um, giving people feedback. So, uh, you know, performance improvement plan shouldn't be a surprise. And then also hiring. So you've talked about those, those three things. But as you were going through this time as a young 20 something, who did you, did you have a, a method of support or knowledge or resources? Like, I'm just thinking back at 25, thank God I wasn't leading anyone. I was bad enough in my thirties, but like, <laughs> like, I can't, like, I can't, I was just trying to think who would I go to for that resource? Yeah. My manager was amazing. Um, and he clearly saw potential in me that I didn't see, which is part of why he was like, take it, you know, I'm grateful for that. Don't get me wrong. This is not a complaint. But at the time I was like, what? Are you serious? Are you sure? Are you sure? (laughs) Yeah. So I I think especially if you are going to be a manager of managers, um, you really need to make sure that that person has the support that they need. Mm -hmm. I sought out a lot of mentorship. I am not afraid to ask for help. Um, And if I'm being honest, part of that is a defense mechanism. As in, I don't want you to think I know what I'm doing because I know I'm making mistakes. So I'm going to protect against Mm. you thinking that way by asking for a lot of help. So there is that element to it, like as a defense mechanism almost, but also I'm really grateful for it. And now it's got nothing to do with that. I'm just very clear on what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, where I need to grow. And asking for mentorship from people who aren't necessarily like some CEO somewhere or the most senior person at the company, ask for mentorship from the person who's just gone through what you're going through Mm -hmm. or maybe a year or two ahead. You know, they're the people that have just lived it. So I had a, um, a big network of people that I would ask for help from. And because of the cyclical nature of it, honestly, like that team career passed out and then I had new people come through and it was like, okay, here I go again. What did I learn? Let's apply it here. Here, you know, there were probably four or five cycles of that just in that company. Mm -hmm. And then I moved into other companies and had leadership and hiring responsibilities there. Um, So always, always as a manager reflecting when a person leaves, what should I have done differently to support them? And I I also think what shifted for me was the way that I viewed my role. I think in traditional corporate structures, we think of it as a hierarchy and the CEO is on top, you know, her chiefs are below and then they all fan out. But I think the way to lead people successfully is to actually flip that and to think of yourself as the bottom Here are my team. What can I do to support all of them so that they can be successful and they can shine in the roles that they have? And when I flipped that in my mind, it wasn't, you know, are you doing the job or not? It's what do you need from me to feel supported? And when you can ask someone that question and genuinely mean it and actually, you know, take it on. (laughs) Because I've also seen people do it and it's just, it's not real. Um, but if you mean it and you listen to it and you actually do what they tell you, then you're also taking a lot of pressure off because you're giving them the ability to tell you what they need rather than you trying to think about what they need to do their job. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that was a really powerful shift for me. Yeah. I love that you could be, (laughs) you can learn each cycle. Okay. All right. Here's another cycle. I'm a little bit better. And then leadership positions. I'm sorry my early teams. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's, that's what I feel like too. It's like, oh, yeah. So I'm glad you made it through. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you don't formally lead now, but there may be people in um, positions who are listening, who are like, I'm not leading yet. Maybe I will one day, but how do you apply what you've learned as a leader to some of the work that you do as now an entrepreneur? 
So much of it comes down to communication. Kind, clear, transparent communication. And that's true with everyone that I come across as an entrepreneur. It's true with how Bree and I, my co-founder, work together. You know, when I speak to clients, I lay it all out for them. We are a new organization. Here is what we do. Um, here are our clients. This is where we are currently. Rather than trying to pretend like we've been doing this forever and we've got all the answers. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really important takeaway from that time. Your job is to be transparent and to let people make the decisions based off of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't sell yourself short, not saying shoot yourself in the foot and like still, you're still out there selling yourself, but you can still form connections with people and people appreciate that respect and that honesty. And I think that'll get you further than pretending to be someone that you're not or an organization that you're not. Yes. I love that, especially as a business, because there are many there saying that they're something that they're not. So wonderful. All right. So last bit, Lex, Um, if you or if a listener is a new manager and they're out there, especially a young new manager, do you have a piece of advice for them? You've given tons of it. So maybe it's just clear, kind communications, you know, that could be it. But is there a singular piece of advice you give them? If I had to pick one from what I have shared, it's to be transparent and to put it on the table and to say, look, I am a new manager. What do you need from me to be successful? Can't always take it on, still have to make hard decisions, Um, you know, still going to make decisions that you maybe don't like but I am here to support you. How can I best do that? I think if you can start a relationship with that conversation, even if it's your first time managing, then I think that person will respect you and will want to work with you. And that can only be a good thing. Yeah, great advice. I said last thing, but I'm going to give you a last, last thing. Uh, (laughs) For real last thing. I just want to provide a space. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with um, before we close out? You don't have to, uh, but if there is, I'd just like to give uh, my guests some space. I guess I will say whatever management situation you may be dealing with now, um, this sounds really dramatic, but it'll be okay. (laughs) You know, like it's, it's it's one experience over what is hopefully a very long and successful career and be kind to yourself. You're not always going to be someone's favorite person. You do have to make hard decisions. That's part of the job. Um, but maybe zoom out, take a broader lens on whatever it is that's going on and that can help give you the the energy and the courage to to keep going through. Put it all in perspective. Lex, yeah. thanks so much for sharing your story and your honesty with uh, what happened in your leadership career. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for holding these conversations. They're important ones to have. Thank you for joining us on Growing Through It. I'm Jen Arnold, and it's been a pleasure sharing this time with you. If today's story sparked something in you, don't keep it to yourself. Subscribe to our podcast, leave a review, and share it with your fellow leaders. And remember, each episode comes with a nugget of wisdom that we expand on in our newsletter. So if you're eager to put these insights into action, head over to our website at growthsignals.co and sign up for exclusive content that'll give you an edge in your leadership journey. Keep growing and I'll connect with you again soon in our next episode. Until then, take the lessons learned and lead authentically. Authentically.